Take your Bible this morning, please, and turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5, and the first 11 verses will be our passage of study this morning. And as you're turning there, we're going to read the verses before we dig into them and see what the Lord would have for us today. So if you're able, we'll invite you to stand in honor of the hearing and the reading of God's word today. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh Patience, and patience, experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so very much for your precious word to us, and it is so precious. We thank you also, Father God, for the blessed Holy Spirit who is indwelling every believer here today. He's the author of your word, and he's going to give us understanding of this passage today. And not only that, as we ask him to, Lord, he will also help us to apply your word to our lives. And so, Father, have your way with us for these next several minutes. Help us, Lord, not to be distracted by any of the things that have gone on this past week, maybe some things going on later today or perhaps this upcoming week. But for these next several minutes, Lord, Help us to focus on you, on your spirit and his leading, and on your word to our hearts and lives today. And we'll give you all the thanks, all the praise, all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, folks, we are coming to really one of the most thrilling passages in all the Bible here in Romans chapter 5, as we're going to be looking at the results of our justification or the, the benefits of our justification. Now, the Apostle Paul has been showing us our need for justification in chapters 1 to 4. And when I talk about justification, I'm talking about the only way that we as sinners can stand before a holy God. We need to get rid of our sin, all of our sin. We need to be righteous in God's sight. We need to have right standing before him. And we become righteous in God's sight when we come to Jesus Christ by faith, believing not only that he bore our sins, but that he also bore the penalty for our sins. So that now when God looks upon us as believers in Christ, he sees not our righteousness, we, we know what that's all about. Our righteousness is, as Isaiah says, what? As, as, as filthy rags. So God looks on us, he doesn't see our righteousness, but he sees the righteousness of his blessed Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in us. And so having set forth 
our need for justification, Paul now, as we come to chapter 5, goes into some of the results, some of the benefits of our justification. In fact, that's going to be the theme for the next four chapters. The Apostle Paul spends the first four chapters talking about our need for justification, and then the next four chapters he talks about our results or the benefits of our justification. Now what we're going to look at this morning as we begin our study of chapter 5, we're going to see three securities. Three securities. You have on the back of your bulletin the outline, the three points we're going to look at this morning. But we as believers in Christ have three securities given to us that prove that if we've placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that we are safe and secure in that faith for all eternity. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, these three things belong to you. You see them there on your outline. Peace, grace, and glory. These are the three securities of the Christian, of the believer in Jesus Christ. These are your three securities if you've named Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Notice, first of all, the peace that we have with God as believers in verse 1. Verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? Say it. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You mean to say that we never had peace with God before we came to Christ? Well, just take a look. We're going to cover this later, but take a look down at verse 10. Paul says, for if when we were what? Enemies. Folks, not only did we not know peace with God before we came to Christ, we were actually his enemies. But the moment that you and I put our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, friends, the war was over. And peace was established between you and God. You're no longer at war with God. You're now at peace with God. Now let me hasten to add and point out here that there is a difference between peace with God and the peace of God. We see that in, in our passage today, two different things. Paul, when he's writing to the Philippians, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, he says this. He says, and the peace of God, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then again in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, he says again, again to Christians, he says, let, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And so the difference is this. Before we were saved, we were enemies with God. We were at war, spiritually speaking, with God. But when we came to Jesus Christ, at that point in time, we received peace with God. The peace treaty was signed by the blood of Jesus Christ when he died for you and me on the cross of Calvary. And so the moment we trusted Christ, we were having peace with God. And on the basis of that, we now have the peace of God. It can reign and rule in our hearts. It's a peace of God that passes all understanding. We now have that because we have peace with God. Uh, there, there's a fantastic passage in, in Colossians chapter 1. It speaks of this wonderful peace that we now have with God. In, in Colossians chapter 1, beginning of verse 20, listen to this. Paul says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and, and you that were sometime alienated, again, here it is, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. My friends, you know why Jesus Christ really came? To take you and me, who were enemies of God, and to bring peace between us and God and make us his friends. That's why Jesus Christ came in the world. Just another reason why he's known as the Prince of what? Peace. Prince of Peace. Yes. And, and so peace is the first and immediate result of our justification. I, I love Psalm 85, verse 10. 
where the psalmist says that righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Folks, there's a beautiful intimacy between righteousness and peace. When an individual is declared righteous, he or she is at peace with God immediately. And God now looks at that person and no longer sees that person in his sin, but God looks at that person and now sees the righteousness of his blessed Son in us. When God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of Christ in me, and I'm at peace with God. No longer his enemy, now his friend. And that gives me the peace of God. Isn't that great? There, there's a second result of justification, and that is that we stand in his grace. We stand in his grace. Look at verse 2. Paul says, By whom also we have access by faith into this, what? Grace wherein we stand. Friends, when we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ, our standing is in grace. We now stand in God's favor because of Christ, no longer in disfavor because of our sins. It's by his grace that he saved us for sure, but it's also in that grace that we now stand. And if for one split second, God's grace would cease, we would all find ourselves immediately in hell. Think about that. But you know, God's grace never ceases. Praise God. Not even for one fraction of a millisecond. And so we stand in grace just as much as we were saved by grace. It's the grace of God that saved us and it's the grace of God that keeps us. Hallelujah. Amazing grace, you know, you know this. You ought to probably break into singing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. What? Was blind, but now I see. But listen to this. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear? When? The hour I first what? Believed. It just gets better, folks. There's even a third, a third result of our justification, and that's also in verse 2, the middle of the verse, where Paul says, and rejoice in hope of the what? Glory of God. Our confidence this morning, our surety is in the hope of glory. Amen? Amen. Someday, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, someday we're going to be in glory. Someday we're going to be glorified. Someday we're going to see the glory of God. Someday we're going to see God himself. We're going to be in his presence. We're going to be in his heaven. What a hope. What a confidence. What a surety. (laughs) Well, verse 3, and not only so, Oh, it just gets better. Not, not just those three things, but listen to what Paul says. And not only so, but we glory in, say it, tribulations. Oh, wait a minute. We glory, is this the same verse? We glory in tribulations also. Now, Paul, come on. You, you just got us so excited. <laughs> You're reminding us of our peace, of our grace, of our glory, why'd you have to bring up tribulations? I guess we need to remember that even our Lord said that in this life you shall have what? Troubles. You shall have tribulation. What a promise from Jesus. Oh, the blessed promises of God. In this life you shall have tribulation. (laughs) And And so Paul's reminding us here that even though we have peace, even though we have grace, even though we have the hope of glory, that doesn't mean that the Christian life is a bed of roses. In fact, Paul says that as believers, we glory in our tribulations. Now, a better word would be rejoice. We rejoice in our tribulation. We get excited about our troubles and trials. Still sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? How in the world... Can you and I rejoice 
even to the point of getting excited about some of the stuff that's going on in our lives, some of the trials and troubles and tribulations that come our way in life. Well, Paul's simply saying that we can rejoice in our tribulations when we realize all the good things that those tribulations and trials are going to be bringing into our lives. Okay, Paul, where are you going with this? What good thing could ever come out of some of the stuff that's going on in our lives right now? Well, let's see what Paul says. Look at verse 3. He says, We glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Tribulation works patience in our lives. Okay, there's one good thing. And patience experience a better word would be character and experience hope well that's a good thing too isn't it and hope maketh not ashamed that's a good thing because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us folks that's some pretty good stuff amen that we have in the midst of our troubles we have, we have patience Character, hope, no shame, the love of God, the Holy Spirit who is in us. How many would say that those are some things to get excited about? Amen? Even in the midst of our troubles. Even in the midst of our trials and tribulations. We'll get there one of these days, but in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, Paul says, And if children... Now, that's you and I, believers in Christ, we are God's children. As children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that may we also be glorified together. Friends, if Jesus Christ could suffer all that he did for you and me, don't you think that we ought to suffer a little bit for him? Or at least be willing to suffer for him because, oh, he suffered for us. I mean, after all, Paul says in the next verse, verse 18, he says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Folks, glory days are common. Amen? These trials that we're going through aren't going to last forever, but glory does. Heaven does. Our inheritance does in heaven. Paul goes on to describe more fully the love of God in, in verses 6 to 8. Just follow along. Verse 6, he says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, uh, for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure, or perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, enemies of God, Christ died for us. Man, that's some kind of love, isn't it? It's the kind of love that dies for helpless, hopeless, weak, ungodly enemies. And that's exactly what every one of us was when Jesus went to that cross 2,000 years ago. And that's the same kind of love that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's now dwelling within us. Well, as exciting as all these things have been thus far, folks, can I say it? You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. Look at verse 9. Paul just keeps building on top of this. He says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from what? From, from wrath. I, through him. I believe that's referring not only to the wrath of God and judgment day for eternity in hell. We're saved from that. I believe also the time of God's wrath during the tribulation period. We're saved from that as well. And that's another message. That's another series of messages someday. But listen... If he loved me enough to declare me righteous while I was a sinner, while I was his enemy, I know he's going to keep me righteous now that I'm his friend. Amen? Yeah. 
Does that make sense? Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, and we were, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, being, being saved, being redeemed, we shall be saved by his life. Listen, folks. If Christ's death could save me, and it did, how much more will his exalted, glorified life on the throne of heaven keep me saved and keep me safe and keep me secure throughout all eternity? Paul said in Philippians 1.6, you're familiar with this verse, Paul says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, and really he's only, with, he's only just begun, He's only just begun with us. But he which has begun a good work in you will perform it. He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Again, friends, I say if Jesus Christ was willing to die for the salvation of his enemies, don't you think he'd be willing to live for the keeping of his friends? Well, verse 11, just reading this as we close and, and move into the Lord's table this morning, communion. He says, verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. It's ours, the atonement. Reconciliation, redemption, salvation, eternal life. It's ours. And we can joy in that. We rejoice in that. We get excited about that, amen? But not everybody that we know and love has all this that we have in Jesus Christ. And, and that's why we come back again, as, as I shared at the beginning of our service time this morning, we come back again to the gospel and sharing the gospel, being heralds of the gospel of Jesus Christ because there's a multitude that are still lost in their sin. They are still enemies of God and targets of God's wrath for all eternity unless they come to Christ. And we know the way. we got to show them that way, folks. Amen? If we truly claim to love those that we know, and that are part of our family, part of our friends, part of our maybe work associates, neighbors. If we truly love them, love is an action, right? Love is a doing thing. It's not just an emotion. And that doing thing, that action, is sharing the way to Jesus Christ with them. We can't keep it to ourselves.